So uh, good morning, good evening, and good night again. Um, this is Gang Chen from MIT. Uh, welcome to MIT InnoTherm Colloquia uh, number six. And today's uh, colloquium is on battery thermal management and safety. And I'm very excited to uh, have uh, this uh, excellent uh, list of panelists. I'll leave this uh, to moderator Christina Amon to introduce. So let me uh, introduce uh, Christina, uh, our moderator today. Uh, Christina is a friend and uh, uh, she's a currently uh, professor, uh, alumni, uh, distinguished professor in bioengineering from the University of Toronto. And she served as Dean of uh, School of uh, Applied Science Engineering of University of Toronto and the director of the Institute for Complex Engineering Systems at the College Manor. She is a member of Canadian Academy of Engineering, Hispanic uh, Engineering uh, Academy, uh, of uh, National Academy of Engineering, and the Royal Academy of Spain. And uh, um, actually, my uh, blocked so, but the. Uh, 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 and uh, her research in the nanoscale of thermal transport, thermal fluids, and uh, engineering systems. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Christina and turn um, the podium to Christina. Thank you. Let me now share the screen. Can you see? Yes. yes. All right. So thank you again for introducing today's InnoTherm Colloquia on thermal management of and safety for batteries, a topic that it is of great relevance, more so with the increasing adoption of electrical vehicles. Uh, and thank you to our colleagues at MIT, Gan Chen, Asegun Henry, John Linhar, and Evelyn Wang, for envisioning this colloquia on thermal innovations, uh, which brings together researchers from thermal fluid sciences and beyond to share our knowledge in, in emerging and relevant topics within thermal fluids. Again, welcome everyone. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to moderate today's panel. Um, and we have a group of outstanding researchers and innovators. The speakers have um, diverse and complementary expertise um, in areas relevant to thermal effects on the performance and safety of batteries. Each panelist will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes, and the remaining will be discussions and Q&A. Next, I'll mm. provide a brief introduction from each speaker in the order of their presentations, and I'll introduce all of them right now, and then pass the uh, sharing screen to them. Our first panelist is Professor Chao Yang Wang from Mechanical Engineering at Penn State. He's the director of the Electrochemical Engine Center and he serves on the executive committee of the Battery Division of the Electrochemical Society. His research expertise is in the areas of thermofluid sciences applied to energy system, transportation, batteries, and fuel cells. Chao Yang has numerous, received numerous recognitions for his contributions, including induction to the National Academy of Inventors. The next speaker is Professor E. Kui from Stanford University, Department of Material Science and Engineering the Photon Science Directorate and the Precord Institute for Energy. His research areas are in synthesis and self-assembly of nanocrystals and nanowires, 
transport in nanomaterial, nano interfaces with particular applications to electronic and photonic devices, solar cells, fuel cells, batteries, and more. He was also recognized with a number of awards, including the Sloan Research Fellowship. Our first speaker um, and presenter is um, Dr. Ahmad Pesaran, Chief Energy Storage Engineer at NREL, National um, Re Renewable Energy Lab. He has a long trajectory of remarkable contributions in research related to transportation, electrical vehicles, including hybrids, automotive batteries, as well as lithium ion battery safety and battery recycling, which is indeed another key emerging area of research. Ahmad is a fellow of the Society of Automotive Engineers and a strategic member of the US Advanced Battery Consortium. And our fourth presenter and panelist is Dr. Eric Darcy from NASA Engineering and Safety Center. He's the lead in the battery technical discipline with tremendous expertise in battery safety and lithium ion batteries. Eric is the recipient of the R&D 100 award and was named the NASA Ambassador Fellow. Next, let me say a few words about the agenda and how we will handle the Q&A. Um, as we said, each panelist will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will have the Q&A sections for the remaining about 30 minutes or so. It's advancing on its own. Anyhow, let me continue. Uh, to submit your questions as a participant, to submit your question to the panelists, please use the Q&A icon in Zoom. We will not have the chat option, so use the Q&A icon in Zoom. The questions will be visible only to the moderator and the panelists, not to the participants. And we will choose questions from those we receive. We will also indicate the name of the person asking the question. Um, and if you prefer to remain anonymous, please say so. But our preference is to attach a question to a name. I'd like also to notice that this colloquium is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. We will also post online the questions which may not, we may not have time today to respond lively. So next, I pass the sharing screen to the first presenter, Chao Yang Wang. Can you? Oh. It's at the end of your slides. Yeah. Oh. You just need to scroll up. Now, uh, you still see my two screens, right? Or yeah, just go, one? Go to dis display settings at the top. Okay. Yeah. Should I uh, duplicate? How about now? Yes. Good. good. You can hear me too, right? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you, uh, Christina. And also thank you uh, again for organizing this uh, curriculum. I think this is a uh, touch upon a very important topic. And also, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, I will very uh, highlight just a few basics of uh, uh, 
the battery thermal management and safety, and then I will, uh, you know, uh, let uh, my uh, colleagues on the panel uh, give you uh, much more depth. Okay, so uh, lithium-ion battery involves uh, basically an anode and a cathode and then an electrolyte in between. Okay, so uh, during charge and discharge, you, you, you have lithium ions shuttling between the two electrodes and uh, uh, this is how, uh, you know, uh, the lithium ion cell works. And a common material for the anode is usually carbon or graphite, uh, whereas the cathode uh, may uh, consist of uh, metal oxide, layered metal oxides, or uh, olivine uh, lithium ion phosphate. So, um, and both electrodes involve uh, what we call the uh, intercalation uh, reactions where the lithium ions can be inserted or extracted uh, during charge and discharge. Uh, now, here's a quick uh, review of how a lithium ion cell uh, is built. So you start, we started out with a, a sari preparation by mixing uh, active material powders, uh, whether it's a graphite or you know, uh, metal oxide powders, with uh, binders and solvents. And, uh, and then we go through the first stage, uh, so-called electrode production. So you do mixing, and here are a couple of pictures showing the mixing and coding, followed by coding, calendaring, to get the right porosity of electrode and thickness, and then you cut it, we call slittering. And once the cut electrode uh, are made and they were transferred to the second stage, which is called the cell assembly. So in the cell assembly, uh, those electrodes will be uh, uh, wound uh, together with separator uh, for, uh, into a jelly roll uh, for cylindrical cells, or they can be uh, stacked up uh, uh, for prismatic cells. So this is a stacking machine. And once those uh, jerry rows or stacked electrodes are made, and a picture is showing here, and they will be put into a case or a pouch. And after drying a vacuum, you fill up with the electrolyte and seal the cell. And then basically you have a lithium ion cell. And then you go through the last stage of uh, cell formation. So it's a bunch of uh, uh, small current and voltage uh, processes to get the SCI layer uh, formation and stabilized and, and all that stuff. And so after that, the cell will be ready to use. So this is a, a very quick review of how lithium ion cell is uh, manufactured, right? Now, coming back to the first topic of this uh, uh, curriculum, so uh, battery thermal management obviously is tremendously important. Uh, and uh, the most uh, important equation or the fundamental equation governing battery thermal management is, is this heat balance between the heat generated from a battery cell uh, balanced by the heat dissipation from the cell that was, you know, a heat trans coefficient surface area and then the cell temperature minus the ambient coolant temperature, okay? Now, once this balance is maintained, you would have uh, zero temperature rise, and that's a perfect thermal management, right? So let's examine a little bit. Chao Yang, you are uh, on mute right now. How about now? Good, okay. All right, so once you, uh, let's examine some of the detail of this, uh, each of the term in this key equation. So heat generation rate <clears throat> from a battery. Oh, I don't have a control now. Oh, here we go. So heat generation rate can be easily calculated from the power times the inverse of, of uh, efficiency minus one. 
So let's take a uh, look at, you know, uh, example. And for a passenger car, typically peak power is 100 kilowatt, then immediately for a battery with 90% round trip efficiency, we are talking about about 10 kilowatt heat generation from a battery pack. And similarly for a fuel cell with 50% efficiency, you will be talking about 100 kilowatt. So it's one to one ratio between heat generation and power, right? On the other hand, for ICE, internal combustion engine vehicles, with 30% efficiency, and the heat generation is actually tremendous, 230. So in comparison, you could argue that the amount of heat generated from battery pack is pretty small. Second term, temperature difference, that are T, that is driving heat dissipation from the cell. And again, if you look at the three cases, for the battery powertrain, and we are usually talking about, you know, 35 degrees Celsius cell temperature dissipating heat into 25 uh, uh, coolant temperature. So you talk about that T of 10. On the other hand, for fuel cell powertrain, which operate at 80 degrees Celsius, you have 55 uh, temperature difference and 95 for ICE, whereas a you know, the coolant for ICE typically runs at 120 degrees Celsius. So the temperature difference is tiny also for battery powertrain. And for those of you who are thermal engineers, and your job really is to design and engineer this H times A, right? So in this case, it boils down to about one kilowatt per degree for batteries and 1.8 for fuel cell powertrain and 2.4 for uh, uh, ICE powertrain. So immediately you can learn that, you know, a few things. And number one, heat generation battery actually is tiny, teeny, uh, if you compare with other devices. And battery cooling, uh, which boils down to H times A, shouldn't be a much challenge if you look at those numbers, right? And if we can further increase the data T for batteries from 10 degree right now to 35 in the future. And assuming the battery would operate stably at, at 60 degrees Celsius, then the H times A value will be an order of magnitude lower than that for ICE. So it so would be, you know, we probably can make the battery thermal management problem go away that way, right? So, uh, uh, here again, let's uh, you know explore a little bit more about this key equation and each of the terms involved, and this gives you a lot of uh, actually basic ideas about how to do thermal management. So, in terms of heat flux, in expressed in the unit of watt per square centimeter, for the battery cooling, a usual is less than one. A lot of times, it's much less than one, and that is compared to greater than ten to two for electronics cooling. So, we're talking about two to three order of magnitude uh, uh, easier job uh, uh, for battery thermal management or for battery cooling. And uh, the heat transfer coefficient is usually related to uh, what we, you know, uh, call the force convection or natural convection in the practice of battery management. Uh, whether you use a liquid or air, this all impact the heat transfer coefficient. And there's not much talk uh, right now about radio cooling, but I think in the future, this it could be in a future area for exploration. Uh, we talk a lot about the heat transfer area A in thermal management for batteries and through extended fins, aluminum, you know, uh, uh, surfaces, or cold plates and heat sinks. And this is, uh, those, all those techniques are often employed in battery mass thermal management. And that boils down to A. Now, that are T, that factor has been not so much played in the research and development, I think has been uh, largely overlooked. Uh, but, you know, one could imagine that if we can engineer or modify battery genes to operate stably at higher temperatures, say at a 60 to 90 degrees Celsius, and to make batteries more like fuel cells, right? PAM fuel cell, poly polymer electrolyte, membrane fuel cells. And then you have a tremendous data T and that will make the uh, task of 
battery thermal management really, really easy. Uh, one last note that I want to put down here is about phase changing material because this is something also has been researched and suggested in uh, the practice of battery thermal management. And uh, now, uh, aside from numerous problems with, you know, PCM and you know, solid liquid phase transformation and the leakage problem and all that, but uh, for phase change material, I would look at uh, the, uh, the most important uh, parameter, and that is energy density, because phase change material essentially is thermal energy storage, it's very much like battery as electric energy storage, right? So we should look at the thermal uh, energy density. And uh, if you take the typical uh, PCM, like a wax, it usually has a latent heat about 200 kilojoules per kilogram. And if you convert it into watt hours, so divided by 3.6, effect of 3.6, that boils down to about 55 watt hour per kg. And now this can be compared to the energy density of lithium ion battery, which you know we talk about 200 to 300 watt hour per kg. So immediately we know those PCM materials has a very, very low energy density, probably is five to six times lower than lithium ion batteries. And you would, you know, always want to think whether or not you want to use something that is low energy density, which means, you know, uh, heavier and bulkier uh, materials to do thermal management. So uh, that's something I want to, you know, mention to the community as well. Um, now, in terms of the safety, uh, normally we characterize the battery safety using this so-called uh, thermal runaway curve where you basically show the uh, cell temperature rise and uh, uh, running to the sky over time and you know in different temperature ranges different uh, uh, chemical reactions involved and, and typically below 80 to 100 it's safe and then about 100 you have SCI layer. Uh, decomposition after that you have anion graphite solvent reaction which is also uh, exothermic, uh, increase the heat and uh, temperature and then it leads to electrolyte decomposition once about 200 degrees Celsius you start to see some cathode uh, uh, what we call onset of uh, instability and that will release, make the cathode release oxygen, cause combustion, eventually you have flame fire and explosion. Uh, I think my colleagues on the panel will get in a lot more in detail into this uh, thermal runaway event. Uh, but all those uh, 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 reactions described in this thermal runaway curve actually account for chemical reaction only. So such as, you know, we often talk about electrolyte flammability and cathode onset instability. And in this discussion, there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about, you know, NMC versus LP because, you know, the uh, onset temperature for instability of NMC is around 200, 200 to 250, whereas FP is much higher, probably more than 500 degrees Celsius. But uh, in addition to chemical reactions of, you know, battery materials, we also should realize that the battery is actually a device that is capable of discharge energy. So once you have uh, internal shorting or external shorting, uh, the battery will be able to release all the energy contained in it. And that consequence of electrochemical reaction, okay, in the presence of shorting can be best uh, quantified by this so-called adiabatic temperature. So adiabatic temperature is basically assuming all the energy released by a battery will be absorbed by the thermal mass of the battery material. So that makes E equal to, okay, I think I need to go really fast, right? So that makes the electric energy equal to MCP delta T, which gives you the maximum temperature rise after all the energy, electric energy is released. If you do a simple manipulation, that is energy density divided by CP. So let's do a very quick example. So solid state batteries that we hear every day in the medium or in research papers, and they claim to have 400 to 500 watt hour per kg 
energy density and at the same time super safe. But if you calculate the adiabatic temperature rise, it's between 1400 to 1800 degrees Celsius. So obviously everything's gone, even if you have very uh, non-flammable uh, electrolyte, uh, solid electrolyte, right? So we have to be careful when you, when you claim that uh, the solid state batteries are safe. Even if only 10% of the energy is released, we will see the ten, a cell temperature rise between you know, 170 to 200 degrees Celsius. And that's already causing the melting of this metal on the anode side. So now you're, you have solid electrolyte, but the liquid anode material, which will cause internal shorting with cathode everywhere. So it's a, it's a very messy thing. Uh, once you understood, uh, once we understood the, the basic numbers and the basic equation, then we can actually do uh, engineering and, 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 and thermal management of safety pretty uh, quickly by using uh, with the help of software. So here I just show a quick, uh, uh, you know, uh, overview of how we do actually a complete solution for thermal management and safety. So you start with, let's say, complete the CAD drawing of uh, modules consisting of multiple cells, sometimes hundreds of cells, and together with cooling channels, and you can automatically generate mesh and to uh, 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 create uh, thermal fluid simulations and, and coupled, fully coupled with electrochemistry and uh, uh, electrochemical models, and that basically give you a digital battery that you can put in any kind of virtual testing and performance and abuse. So one of the you know, software is available from this uh, company called Gamma Technologies. Uh, also, you know, once we understood the fundamentals, we can actually start to create some simple innovation. One example I show you here is, is called Safe Energy Dense Battery or SAB, and that can achieve high safety and high energy density simultaneously, right? And our strategy is very simple. And what we do is we basically design and build a very, very stable batteries uh, using stable uh, materials and very low reactivity interfaces. So the result is, you know, and the battery itself, uh, when it's not used, is, have, is highly stable and has a very high safety and low degradation, right? So we, you know, it's a cool battery, as cool as a cucumber, right? But then right before you drive or use the battery, you can, we can actually use a thermal switch to uh, change it into the high power mode for use, right? So that is thermal switch can be activated by uh, heating. So we, uh, you know, with that uh, kind of battery, you can actually, with that kind of very stable battery, you can actually achieve more than 4,000 cycles. And that translates to, uh, you know, uh, what uh, again, uh, originally or initially said uh, million mile battery. But in our case, this is even million mile operated at 60 degrees Celsius, right? Under very harsh environment, we could still achieve million mile battery. Uh, it's a very safe and you can see that the black curve is the uh, internal or the uh, charge transfer resistance or baseline and all those other colors ones are the, the SAB uh, uh, batteries and we see much larger uh, charge transfer resistance. So uh, sometimes high re uh, highly resistive batteries are very good for safety and indeed if you do nail penetration and for cell batteries, the highest temperature rise is only 100 degrees Celsius versus almost 1,000 degrees Celsius for the baseline. So we could achieve a battery that is energy as dense as NMC graphite, but as safe as uh, uh, LFP graphite. Okay. So very quickly, I'm putting a summary here uh, since I'm running out of time. Um, I think we, uh, for battery management and safety, we need more fundamental thinking and from basic numbers and back on envelope calculations are very useful. In terms of actual design and uh, development, we can rely on simulation-based uh, 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 tools and uh, techniques. I expect abundant technical inno innovation in the years to come because I think we now, uh, 
understand very well the 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 uh, you know fundamental mechanisms of battery management and safety. And uh, one of the you know innovation I believe will uh, we believe that uh, is uh, useful for the future is uh, coming up with a switchable electrochemical interfaces. Right. So when we don't use a battery, we can turn it off. When we need the to battery to produce power, you turn it on. That kind of thing, rather than it's always ever present electrochemical interfaces right now. And uh, I would say, you know, uh, as a uh, final uh, word, and, and I always find the most difficult job or task is to make our ideas simple our innovation simple, so we're constantly, you know, working towards uh, that goal. So with that, I'm going to stop here and then turn, stop share and turn over to, to Yi, right? Yes, let me jump for a moment. Um, thank you, Chao Yang. Um, also, I'd like to remind the presenters to keep the presentations to 10 minutes so we have enough time for Q&A. And I'd like to remind the participants, the audience, to start sending your questions through the Q&A icon on the Zoom screen. Next, I Kui, Professor I Kui. Yeah, thank you, Christina, and thank you, Chao Yang, for the very nice introduction already on the thermal, uh, the thinking of uh, temperature, the thermal issue on the batteries. Uh, now let me go down to, uh, I would say, deep inside the batteries, right, and the more small land scale and down to materials and chemistry and give you an uh, introduction on the thermal effect. Um, Chao Yang already mentioned about the you know, the basic battery cells, so I, I won't repeat that. But I want to mention is this is related to thermal, the temperature issue during the operation, this electron transport needed, uh, ion diffusion needed into liquid electrolyte. You know, these are the liquid carbonate flammable electrolyte. And also, uh, uh, you know, in the solid state is particle, whether it's graphite or is, uh, you know, the lithium metal oxide cathode. What well, is structure and volume transformation going on right there. There will be stream build up. Um, and uh, also remember the interface uh, between the electrode and the electrolyte, particularly in the negative electrode, the graphite side, uh, this SEI, so-called the solid electrolyte interface. That's the self decomposition compound of organic electrolyte coating indicated right here on these particles with this very thin layer of coating in the order of 10 to 30 nanometer range, having the iron coming in and out, and this one will be affected by the uh, temperature quite a bit. Um, so during the lithium ion batteries operation, if you plot the potential, the voltage right there, for the cathode on the top, the curve, the anode at the bottom right there, if you look at this, well, if you look at the anode, the, during charging, uh, lithium ion coming in, electrons coming in, you know, you have this plateau, the graphite starts to take in a lot of lithium. And make sure you don't go below the graphite potential to go down to lithium plating. If the, it's zero watt uh, below that versus lithium metal, you can, have, you can deposit lithium metal. So I'm going to come back to that and how temperature will affect this process. And right here, this SEI formation below roughly about one watt, 1.2 watt also, you start to decompose the electrolyte forming this solid electrolyte interface. On the cathode side, you are going to charge it up, the potential goes up, you see the plateau. And then once it go over to a certain uh, voltage, roughly about 4.2, 4.3 watt, you start to uh, worry about the electrolyte oxidation. You know, anode is the reduction cathodized oxidation right there. The temperature will accelerate oxidation on the cathode side. So that's something you need to uh, take care of, think about once the thermal issue really comes in. So then how does the temperature affect this chemistry? We know in the cold weather when the temperature is very low, electrolyte resistance goes up because it's more viscous and you have low power output right there. And the lower temperature, you want to push uh, lithium going to graphite during charging 
However, this push-in process becomes slower, and then you can potentially have lithium plating happen easier. Then this can cause dendrite formation and potential battery shorting. And also remember the, uh, oh, this is electrolyte freezing. Uh, uh, you know, if you go to the really low temperature, this can cause a physical damage. And the high temperature is a different effect. Of course, you have high ionic conductivity, but something you have to worry about is the side chemical reaction becomes more. On the anode side, SEI, on the cathode side, more oxidation. So you need to really uh, uh, pay attention to that. That can potentially shorten the battery life. Um, then if you look into further, Chao Yang give you an introduction about, well, when I operate my batteries right there, I will have uh, heat generation inside the batteries, right? And particularly under fast charging, you know, increase the charging speed, uh, you're going to have more heat generation for a you know, given time. And you will build out a temperature a gradient even more. Uh, having this temperature effect right there, this left hand side is really plotting to you, you know, the fast charging. Uh, once you go to the XFC, extremely fast charging condition, you are really using uh, the, um, the power in the order of uh, close to uh, 300 kilowatt of the power. Uh, under this condition, there's many effects, you know, the temperature can uh, really affect the processes uh, under the fast charging condition. The first one will be, um, you have this lithium transfer profile during charging. The anode will taking in lithium, the cathode will, you know, uh, the lithium coming out, iron coming out in the cathode side. So you build up this concentration gradient. Then the thickness of the electrode will affect this gradient a lot. You want to go down to thinner electrode usually to uh, avoid this, uh, you know, large gradient profile right there. So this electrolyte con conductivity, transference number, electrode thickness and tortuosity will affect uh, these uh, lithium transport. So certainly temperature will also affect the higher temperature will help reducing this gradient. And then the charge transfer across the interface is very important as well. So lithium and the electrolyte solvated by these uh, solvent molecule, it needs to get desolvated. Desolvation will take place across the SCI interface and then transport into the graphite right, right there. So all these processes can be affected by the temperature as well. The next thing is the temperature in homogeneity will build up. I'm plotting, uh, you know, uh, showing a cylinder cell right here, but it will be similar. Pouch cell will have this effect right there. In the middle, in the center of the battery will be get hotter. Outside walls will be, a, uh, when you get to the outer surface approaching to room temperature, you are going to have temperature gradient inside the battery cells. This gradient will cause the problem of, you know, certainly higher temperature will give you faster kinetic, higher current, but higher current will easily will also drive the uh, heat generation even more. So this can become a positive uh, feedback loop. And then the higher temperature part will get cycle charging and discharging uh, more. The current density is higher compared to a lower temperature Part. This can potentially create uh, issues. <laughs> Let me give you one example. So what issue can create is with this temperature uh, you know, in homogeneity. And this experiment we conducted really using the local laser to heat up uh, our current collector on the anode side. So you have this local hot spot and uh, we could use the uh, graphene on the top surface using the Raman ship to indicate what's the temperature right there. Uh, it is a linear relationship between the power and the, uh, 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 you know, these uh, Raman ship right there. So under this condition, if you look into this, the top row is the SEM of during lithium plating and the location, the spot, you have higher temperature. Once you have the laser heating on the backside, you can see there's a lot more lithium metal deposition taking place right there locally. And uh, through a careful study and thermal simulation, we find out, oh, yeah, this higher temperature, local hotspot, increase the so-called extreme current density, increase the kinetics of deposition of lithium a lot more. So you can locally amplify by using temperature of this deposition, and that can cause potential shorting of the batteries right there. 
So these, uh, we want to point it out, you know, this temperature in homogeneity can cause uh, actually quite uh, a complex effect right there in the uh, lithium metal battery charging. I also want to emphasize the temperature effect affect the uh, thermodynamics of the battery electrode, uh, particularly the potential. The potential relationship of the voltage is related to delta G of the reaction, right? If you look at the delta G, how that translates into the voltage is using this Nernst equation uh, uh, right there. Uh, uh, that's the, the origin of the uh, voltage of the, uh, of the electrochemical cells. So then the voltage temperature coefficient is indeed related to the delta S, the entropy of the system. And the electrochemical system, and this delta S turned out to be actually quite big because of this solvation energy right there, solvation entropy, as well as the lithium ion or other ions, if you look at other system, uh, and the uh, uh, solid state can provide the mobile ion quite a bit of entropy contribution as well. In the early days, back in 2014, in collaboration with Gang uh, Chen, uh, we have a joint postdoc, uh, you know, uh, working together uh, right there, and already showing using the high entropy of the electrochemical system, we can utilize that to harvest a waste heat, convert it back into the uh, electricity and store and use. Uh, uh, that was the early uh, indication of a very large uh, entropy, a larger temperature coefficient right there. Now let me share with you under the lithium ion system, uh, and uh, what's the implication right there? And this uh, lithium battery electrode, we actually can design and measure the temperature coefficient of the voltage using this uh, H cell, right? H shape of cell. The same electrode, uh, 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 these are flasks, they're sitting into a different temperature. We measured its uh, voltage, open circuit voltage can determine the temperature coefficient. You know, that's when you change the temperature, you measure OCV at different temperature. And this is for lithium metal. And then we can measure the graphite as well. And uh, you, you plot this, this is the, uh, the voltage change versus temperature. This indeed is uh, giving us uh, this linear uh, temperature coefficient in the order of about one milliwatt per Kelvin, or say per degree Celsius. So this is actually very high temperature coefficient right there. What does it mean right there? Once you increase the temperature, the voltage goes up, right? Imagine you have a battery cell electrode, and there's a temperature in homogeneity in there. This is for graphite. In the middle right here is higher temperature. Its potential lithium plating is, will go up with temperature. Once it go up, to the potential, it's even higher than the room temperature region of the graphite intercalation potential. You indeed will have lithium plating already happening in the hot temperature. Even though in the full cell, you're thinking about your graphite has not go down to the voltage to plate it yet for the room temperature, but for the local higher temperature uh, spot, you already exist the lithium plating potential. So the plating will happen. What I want to say is if you have a battery, the inside is hot, the outside is cold, particularly under fast charging condition, it's entirely possible inside will plate lithium metal, even though the potential, at the, if you think in the room temperature, doesn't reach the plating potential, but for the hot temperature, you already do. So that's actually very dangerous. So let me go one step further in, in terms of the bad materials and chemistry. So if you have a shorting happening, and then the shorting uh, can, well, this shorting can be in, in, induced by many reasons. I believe later our speakers uh, right there will tell you more exciting, you know, a uh, 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 study on, on this. And the, uh, Chao Yang also mentioned, you know, once your temperature goes up, you cause all these uh, phenomenon happening, SCI, decomposition, reaction, chemical reactions st start to happen roughly about 200 degrees Celsius also, you know, for the MMC cathode, you can go into the regime of catching fire. So we look at the rate of heat generation through this temperature at about 150 degrees Celsius also, you know, you have the SEI decomposition at, uh, uh, you know, a separate melting. This is happening, building out the temperature and then trigger the thermal runaway. Temperature goes up very, very fast. Uh, so I won't go into the detail of that. 
So to mitigate that, let me go down to the uh, chemistry level. Is how, to, how do you do that? First well, idea I want to point out is it's already in use. People use fire retardant, adding in the additive into the organic electrolyte. And uh, we also, you know, recently uh, uh, you know, invented an idea and say we need to encapsulate this fire retardant into a polymer. The reason is the more fire retardant you add in, you are going to increase the viscosity of the, of the electrolyte. So lithium ion conductivity and the electrolyte becomes smaller, harder to battery to operate. So instead, we encapsulate this green color of uh, additive uh, of this fire retardant into polymer. So until you hit a certain temperature, the polymer melts and release the fire retardant knowing the danger is coming, release it and then uh, quench the fire. And we also think about the idea, you know, a shorting is an important trigger of the battery safety problem. Can we do something about this? And the industry is, industry is already used, it's the ceramic coating onto the uh, uh, separator to enhance its stability against the shorting. Uh, uh, a few years ago, we also come on the idea is inside the separator, you have cathode and anode inside the separator having a lithium metal detection, half shot detection. If the shorting happened already halfway, you detect it, make sure you don't do the battery charging anymore. So to avoid the shorting continue to grow to fully short the batteries. So we also consider to add in something like thermal switch onto the electro coating. If the temperature goes up, this is in collaboration with Jenna and Bao at Stanford right here. Temperature goes up, this coating layer going from a conducting, elect electrical conducting, uh, metallic conduction become a pure insulator. This orders of magnetic resistance change and shut down the electrical conducting pathway so you cannot re release the electricity right there so avoid the fast heat up of the batteries. So I believe that more innovations are needed to enhance these uh, thinking of thermal trigger, the battery safety concern. So in sum summary, so I was telling you a number of effects right there, uh, the uh, temperature can do to the batteries. I will not repeat this whole list uh, and uh, I will uh, you know, wait until we go into the panel to have more discussion with you. Let me stop right here uh, and stop sharing. Uh, so next I'll let uh, Ahmad to uh, come up to uh, tell you what I uh, want to share with you. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Thank you, Yi, and uh, I appreciate uh, Christina for the introduction. Uh, thanks for Dr. Chen and uh, MIT for organizing this. Xiao uh, Yang and uh, Yi provided a very good introduction to what's going on with the batteries and science of the behind the temperature. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the uh, practical aspects of thermal management of BBs. Uh, uh, and for some reason, Zoom has decided to give me this uh, background. Uh, so, uh, so uh, an EV pack consists of many modules that as uh, Chao Yang shows you, you have a, uh, a stack of anode and cathodes that you make a cell out of them. And of course you put all these cells into uh, a module and then a module into a pack and these are LG chem, sorry, LG chem cells into GM uh, uh, volt which is 16 kilowatt and actually I show you a picture of these things that that is uh, maybe about five or six years old and uh, the technology has improved a lot and you can have in the same volume almost 100 kilowatt hour of uh, battery in there. Uh, you can have many different sizes, cylindrical uh, shapes, cylindrical pouch or prismatic into the, the paddy pack. Uh, so uh, 
So these series of parallel inter uh, an inter uh, series of uh, series and parallel integration of these cells give you the voltage and power energy required, but it need to meet life and cost targets. Uh, so we need to have some battery management system from both mechanical, electrical, and thermal perspective for robust packaging, kind of crush worthiness, vibration, electrical balancing to give you performance uh, and life that you want. And also, of course, at other attribute would be manufacturing, recyclability, and maintenance and repair so that it'd be easy to cost and maintain these things. So there are uh, many things going on into the battery pack here. Yeah. Uh, uh, so as I mentioned, lithium ion battery is becoming highly uh, uh, important aspects of uh, electric vehicles because of their high performance and cost being decreasing. As uh, Yi and uh, Chao Yang mentioned, kind of high temperature degrees batteries and what, what kind of degradation we have. You can see here on the left side is the capacity of the battery, which is capacity means equal to energy battery. Uh, decreases uh, a battery that's at 25 degrees C can go more than 15 years. If you put it at five, 45 degrees C, you can see only have about five and a half the years capacity. So it becomes challenging. And also not only the capacity, but also power capability, the resi relative resistance of the battery increases uh, and it dies as far as far as the number of cycles increases. So uh, the power goes down and power energy, power energy, relates to uh, range and power relates to acceleration. Uh, so, the, uh, so this is a kind of chart here I show you that kind of tells you where the desired operating temperature for barriers is. I mean, Chao Yang said that uh, kind of the thermal management of barriers is easy because of those, they need to be at uh, low, the heat transfer rates are small. The challenge with compared to the uh, engine is that the engine can run at the uh, 400, 500, 600 degrees C and doesn't degrade at all, actually likes it. But batteries don't like that. You know, let's see my batteries like to operate in this temperature of 15 to 35 and you know that outside is not harsh and actually when you said that you have a winter sluggishness and kind of lithium plating uh, uh, and also degradation happens at higher temperatures. So we need to make it happen in this range because it both impact the range and the performance of the vehicle. So as an example of kind of uh, here on the right side, kind of if a battery that doesn't know cooling in Arizona, kind uh, uh, of goes down and kind of this 80% limit that we have, uh, you can lose a battery in five and a half uh, years. If you add air cooling, you can extend like to six years and a half years. If it's even better cooling, liquid cooling, you can extend it almost 10 years. And that's what, uh, what the, uh, OEMs or car companies are uh, faced with to do these things at cost effectively. And this is actually a, a desired attribute of thermal management. Uh, it's uh, maybe thermal heat transfer easy, but then you have to keep all the cell desired temperature, minimize cell to cell temperature variation in the pack, minimize cell internal temperature in emergency. And we mentioned that the importance of that in emergency in the cell, we need to keep it away from happening. Uh, Preprint temperature from going above uh, acceptable limits and also safety limits. And he's kind of both, uh, both Ye and uh, Xiao Yang show that uh, what happens if uh, doesn't we do that. So also uh, we need one thing that's very important also is kind of amount of energy that you want to use for parasitic powers for maintaining the operation of the uh, the biothermal system. You cannot have a big a uh, refrigerator run on your back uh, car to keep your batteries cool. You need to have minimum amount of energy used. Of course, low weight and uh, uh, low cost is important. So that's become very challenging. I mean, those small heat transfers suddenly become very uh, important. That's uh, on the left side, you have, a, sorry, right side, you have a table of the United States Advanced Battery Consortium that kind of sets all these targets about what we want to do with different type of electric vehicles. So let's get into more uh, uh, aspects of what tools we have uh, to design a better thermal management system. Uh, you know, Chao Yang mentioned a little bit of them, uh, but you need to have characterization tool, experimental tool to measure how much heat you have from a battery. Actually, that's the most important parameter that comes, I mean, at different drive cycles and testing the uh, kind of amount of heat that comes from batteries is much different. 
uh, thermal imaging provide a big picture, a picture of what's going on with the battery and the homogeneity of the cell inside. You need to know thermal conductivity. It's a heat transfer problem. You need to have a heat transfer characterization set up and then, then verify your uh, uh, thermal management system through the loops. We have tools, kind of first order lump capacitance model, examples showed by Chai Yang. We have 1D, 2D thermal models, uh, fluid dynamics models with them. And, and then we used to use 1D integration models that all these provide some good information. The, the, the chart I show you in Arizona was done in 1D integrated thermal fluid model. But then we've learned more and become sophisticated. We added metallic chemical, now we're adding mechanical crush into these things. And we have uh, completed aided these software tools that as Chai Young mentioned. But the basic heat transfer of the thermal management is kind of a heat transfer, kind of what's happening, temperature rise, uh, in the battery it depends on how heat generation and then the, the heat rate, uh, cooling rate or heat, if you want to do heating the battery, the heating rate. The heat generation is uh, reactions, chemical reactions, material phase changes, mixing, and joule heating is the most important. At higher currents, joule heating is the, becomes the dominant uh, factor. So the methods of heat rejection, uh, term, uh, it could be direct air, direct liquid cooling, indirect liquid, uh, play with plates and, and channels and uh, kind of uh, fins and you, you know, play, uh, and even phase change material. But this is kind of, I show you in the bottom kind of example of how you can put a battery pack with the rest of the heat exchangers and the uh, air conditioning system uh, that in your system to cool the battery. So it becomes a little bit more com complicated as soon as uh, we start building up and you need to minimize that. Uh, so as I mentioned, heat generation is very important. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, kind of how the heat rate changes. Uh, so we have at NREL, we have used these isothermal battery calorimeter that kind of measure heat generation as a function of RMS, uh, drive cycles, and you can see each battery is different, different temperatures, different. Uh, we have heat transfer in a modules, and you can see here just going through this with air cooling, there is a temperature in non uniformity about five or eight degrees C within one cell. So we need to make sure that we have a cell that keep it down. Thermal imaging can provide very potential for hotspots uh, uh, that uh, we can see here. You know, uh, this was uh, the design of original design of a uh, uh, Nicomer Heidel body in uh, Toyota Prius generation two. But then they went and did, uh, this was hot spots here, then they went modified and then was the, when we did thermal imaging was completely uniform uh, uh, engineering aspects. So these are today's kind of lithium ion batteries are pretty good. This is where they are right now with lithium ion batteries. Uh, from outside, it looks everything uniform. The tabs can be very hot. Uh, I mentioned about 3D modeling uh, of uh, electrochemical 3D models that we have and Chao Yang mentioned some of it. But uh, let's say how these 3D models can help you. Uh, of course, kind of you design this, so okay, we'll have this kind of uh, design, kind of the two tabs on the same side, and you work on the working potential, what is the electrochemical production, current production, distribution of current, distribution of L, uh, the uh, state of charge in the battery, and then what's the temperature distribution. So you know that, and then you say, okay, what if I design my design changes? So we put the thermal, uh, the two tabs on two different sides. And we, when you do that, uh, you can see the temperature uh, distribution becomes much easier because current distribution is less and homogeneity becomes much more. And actually this is Gen 1, that's what actually GM I think believed it. Gen 1 cell designed from Chevy Bolt and now Gen 2 designed from Chevy Bolt that's in actually the, in the Chevy Bolt today. So it's about almost 60, 100 amp power cells that has two tabs on both sides. And that's what the reason they went through it. So, and then a uh, computer aid engineering tools can you even do from full, full, full thermal, uh, uh, fluid, full thermal uh, heat transfer and uh, uh, all the, the way kind of, this is a uh, simulation of this, uh, Tesla batteries that have liquid cooling around it of all these 1860 cells. And this is the bolt uh, liquid cooling and has thermal cooling plates between them. But you can imagine many different things that uh, is happening. 
So I'd like to summarize uh, by saying that uh, thermal management is needed. Uh, it could be simple at the, the beginning, but it's kind of quickly becomes uh, ex uh, important because you need to optimize weight and cost and performance. You have to use the proper tools uh, to design thermal management systems. And of course, currently the, the indirect liquid cooling with the fins and plates is the uh, biggest standard, people using it and computer design tools using that. Uh, but as batteries get higher energy dense, the, the charge rate faster, each rejection become much also much more challenging. So uh, innovation needed. So I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. So let me share this, stop sharing and pass it on to Eric. All right, uh, so let's see, uh, there we go. And so you guys able to see my screen? All right, thank you, Ahmad. And uh, so I'll speed up here and basically tell you some of the applications that uh, we've been able to achieve um, and get into particularly a high power where the thermal management is critically important. And we've been trying to achieve safe batteries that also are high performing, particularly the goal is to get to 160 watt hours per kilogram in specific energy. We're looking at this for electric airplane applications, and other uh, robotic applications and anything that needs to discharge at a high rate. By high rate, I mean uh, 3C, 20 minute discharges. Been able to do this with a really good group uh, of diverse folks. Um, I used Dr. Ralph White at uh, South Carolina uh, for the modeling aspects, um, doing some real assembly work with a small company in Alabama, and then some new technology that's making it all possible with uh, uh, oscillating heat pipe at Thermavant te Technologies. So uh, I'll briefly just get into the challenges and the solutions and uh, highlights of our testing or verification of achieving passive propagation resistance so that we're tolerant to single cell thermal runaway. And that's what we mean by uh, achieving safety. Um, we want to be resistant to a single cell uh, going into thermal runaway because that's the one failure mode that we can't put a fuse on or can't put a positive control on. And uh, even though they're rare, uh, occurring in about a one in a million prob probability from uh, uh, manufacturers that have their uh, processes under control, every once in a while, even a reputable manufacturer will, have a, will make a bad lot. So we need to be prepared for that. Plus, we also have a requirement that no flames exit the battery enclosure in our spacecraft. And uh, then when we get the high voltage, we also have to have dead facing of our uh, connectors for electrocution uh, hazard control. And then we also have a corona discharge hazard when we get to low pressures at high altitude. Yeah. So our, our baseline is to use commercial cells that are readily available for users um, that achieve uh, the, the requirements here. We uh, went from our database, our previous experience with high energy packs is to go with an interstitial aluminum material uh, <clears throat> that provides a good heat conduction and also provides support for the cans when they misbehave and go into sidewall uh, rupturing as opposed to venting out the top or the bottom. When you have a sidewall rupture like I'm showing here, you can get some uh, defeat, pretty much all the features that you've put placed in the battery to prevent propagation. And so you need to handle that, uh, that failure mode first and protect it. We found when you try to push this type of approach with a very thin interstitial aluminum uh, heat sink that is amounts about a 20% mass fraction, you can't move the heat out very fast and you get large temperature gradients between the inner cells of this uh, hexagonal pack to the outer cells of that pack. And so it's just not, uh, uh, it won't work and to be able to do uh, for a 3C or a high rate discharge. We've got to go to a different solution. So then we start looking, okay, well, uh, how do we get the heat out of these cells and uh, are there limits to what we can achieve? Uh, with just an axial contact down the length of the cell can. So here in a big aluminum block, we put the cell in and we provide very good heat sinking. And we found out that high energy cells 
the ones that are achieving 270 watt hours per kilogram and commercial heat is 50. If you do too good of a job of cooling them, their capacity uh, it really drops off very quickly. In fact, uh, the MJ1 cell from LG in this example here uh, only produces about 2.2 amp hours um, at the 3C discharge rate of 9.6 amps if you keep it at 25 degrees. So these high energy cells have got to run hot. By running hot, they got to run over 50 degrees um, in order to deliver a nameplate capacity. And that, that I mean somewhere around 3.2 uh, amp hours. So this pointed us to, we need to go to higher power cells, give up some capacity. And here's a comparison of a, a high energy, high power cell, the Samsung 30Q versus a high energy cell, the Panasonic GA, both at the same 3C discharge rate around 9.6 amps. And you can see that the uh, Samsung cells were running at a higher uh, running voltage, provides a more total energy um, in to, uh, so we, this was better suited. We give up a little bit of main plate capacity at the beginning, but we have a better operating window at the 3C discharge rate. We don't have to run it right between 50 and 70 degrees Celsius. So uh, we started looking at a spine heat sink approach with every cell is attached uh, by a bond, an epoxy bond to a spine heat sink. We looked at solid aluminum and then and the advanced technology I'll tell you about is the uh, oscillating heat pipe. So we put 16 cells in this type of, a, of an assembly. And uh, here we started, we ended up with a 60 degree contact angle. And I can tell you that uh, we studied that and it didn't really matter uh, how big the contact angle was. And the rest of the spaces were filled with uh, ceramic putty, um, the high temperature ceramic putty material. We also put uh, rings around the stainless steel rings around the spin groove of the cells, which our previous studies have shown that that's the most vulnerable area of the cell for uh, sidewall rupturing. You put all those 16 uh, cell assemblies, six of them together in this, uh, what we call a battery deck um, with uh, 96 cells. And we're able to achieve 160 watt hours per kilogram with this, uh, that Samsung 30Q cell on that. If you go, if you don't have a high rate application, um, you can get 192 uh, watt hours per kilogram by using a higher energy cell and running at, uh, at lower rates. But we're specifically looking at uh, high rates here. And so we put two of these decks into a box uh, like this uh, with some flame arresting features and a, and a commercially uh, a vent assembly, both a gas permeable waterproof membrane from the folks at Gore which are targeting this for electric vehicles. And uh, then we studied uh, the spine. Uh, what kind of thermal conductivity would we need from the spine? What type of epoxies did we need to use? Um, and how important was the heat generation uh, aspect from the cell into that? And we found out that the thermal conductivity of the spine uh, wasn't, or the thermal conductivity of the epoxy bond, or the, we didn't have to use any fancy epoxies. It didn't really matter that much. And the contact area, that contact angle, whether we use 120, 80, 90, uh, even down to 30 degrees uh, of contact angle uh, with, from the cell to the spine didn't matter as much as the thermal conductivity of the spine, the heat sink spine, that's the big factor. And also anything we can do to reduce the cell heat generation, going from the high energy cell to the high power cell really mattered um, quite a bit. And so, that told us that we would never get there with a solid uh, aluminum for at the higher 20 minute discharge. We needed to go to something that was much more conductive. The oscillating heat pipes is uh, with these micro channels and loaded up with uh, ammonia uh, from a company that has the IP for this. It's a Thermavant Technologies, their website over here. I encourage you to go to that and uh, see learn more, more about their technology. Uh, but it greatly reduces the thermal gradients between the, um, the cells. Here you have a side-by-side -side analysis comparison. If you went to a solid aluminum spine, uh, we'd have temperature gradients between the hottest and the coldest cell of 19 degrees. While if you, the oscillating heat pipe with the ammonia bubbling and condensing that occurs from the, from the middle to the ends, um, we reduces, greatly reduces that thermal gradient from the hottest to the coldest cell to uh, two degrees Celsius. That's what the modeling predicts. Uh, the modeling also predicts if it, they are equally good for protecting against a single cell thermal runaway. 
the thermal runaway cell reaches up to 600 plus degrees, but the adjacent cells are protected. They are kept below 100 degrees Celsius. And that's the name of the game here. And this is with two millimeter spacing and our ceramic putty in, as the interstitial material. Most of the heat is shunted into the, uh, the uh, spine uh, or the oscillating heat, heat sink spine. Here's what the assembly looks like. Um, and these are the 16 cell assemblies. Um, here's that ceramic putty I was telling you about, um, showing some of the uh, wiring for the thermistors. For, uh, so we put these two decks together uh, into one box. They're in series for a 100 volt battery pack, two kilowatt hours. And uh, in order to trigger thermal runaway, we use um, our, uh, the NASA NREL internal short circuit device. Uh, which is uh, embedded inside the cells and uh, has a wax layer that melts at 57 degrees and the, produces a hard short due to the winding tension that's in the jelly roll. This is uh, what we think is the most relevant or best way to represent a field failure of a hard internal short. It allows us to only have to heat the cell to over 57 degrees to produce a hard short that produces a thermal runaway response makes it a lot easier to trigger thermal runaway with a lot less biasing of the adjacent cells. So we uh, implanted these cells or built the, these decks with uh, these trigger cells in these locations here that I'm showing. So we had a mixture of corner cells, interior cells, um, and uh, also some edge cells as I'm showing over here. So we had six total trigger cells in our test campaign. Um, we've connected all the cells in a S before P configuration. That means we put the cells in series um, and 12 cells in series, and then connected strings of those 12 cells in series so that eight in, uh, in parallel. So we had two decks and the two decks were then in series. We put a, an arming plug with a fuse embedded for uh, our dead facing requirements so we could take out this arming plug when we're doing the assembly work and put the arming plug at the very end when we want to energize the pack. This is a photo to show you what the pack looks like. As you can see here we had some mica covers on every uh, tops of every cell and that's so that when a, the trigger cell goes into thermal runaway it blows through its mica cover and mica is a very high temperature material. The adjacent cells then are protected from the ejecta Oh, and what I'm showing over here, and here's our little heater, our homemade heater you know, that to heat up the trigger cell in order to drive the thermal runaway response without it heating all the other cells. Here's what the full pack looks like during the assembly. As you can see, our two decks and then our wiring uh, going, our flexible bus bars that go to the arming plug and then our power connectors over here. And then I've got a video that shows a thermal runaway test of a single cell. And that meets our requirements, a very boring test where only smoke uh, comes out and, uh, and no flames exiting the, the battery enclosure. The trigger cell gets very hot uh, as expected, but the adjacent cells here um, stayed below 100 degrees Celsius um, and were very well protected. This is what the pack looked like after the, all six runs were done. We were able to charge and discharge this pack in between runs um, in order to clean up the pack and uh, refresh the, the uh, flame arresting features to clean them up to make it valid for the next test. So the summary, uh, when we went and took apart this pack, uh, we inspected the trigger cells. We didn't see any sidewall rupturing on any of the six cells. Um, and we did have some bottom rupturing uh, in the M36 uh, cell. Um, but uh, we were able to handle that. As long as it doesn't go through the sidewalls, we're, we're good. So we thought the, the putty did a really good job of protecting and providing support to the can wall of these cells, especially these high energy cells. Um, the can walls are getting thinner and thinner, and so they need to, to be protected. So overall, the adjacent cells were well protected. Uh, so we did six of them, two corner cells, two edge cells, two interior cells. Uh, maximum temperatures um, uh, were just above 100 degrees uh, on some, but uh, we were able to uh, cycle the adjacent cells afterwards or, or cycle the battery. Um, so it, uh, it showed that we had good margins um, against that. So 
We did get one run where we got some circulating currents um, afterwards. Uh, we have a way of protecting against that to improve, but overall um, that uh, didn't damage the, uh, the adjacent cells. And overall, our S uh, series before parallel topology uh, provided us with some really good uh, robustness um, so that uh, we were able to cycle the cells uh, before and after, uh, or cycle the battery before and after. If we had used a, a P before S topology, we would have had to use fuse isolation on every cell, and that would have uh, added impedance to the pack and reduced the power of the pack. So the takeaway message is that it is possible to build these battery packs that achieve high energy and high power and be safe. Um, by, uh, by high uh, performance, I mean 160 watt hours per kilogram. Um, we need to high use high power cells. That's a big lesson learned from that. Um, we need to protect the spin groove of the adjacent cell, of all the cells, and that's the most vulnerable area. And the oscillating heat pipe technology uh, is working, uh, working really well for our safety. And we're about to test it for performance. Um, we haven't had a chance to share those results with you yet, um, but it's looking really good on that. So um, we have uh, did some subscale uh, testing prior to all this um, that I wasn't able to share with you, but that all supported that uh, uh, all the little features that we've put in here, such as the blast plate in between the, uh, these decks um, does, a, does perform and, and provide, provide a light pack. So with that, I'll turn it over and uh, stop sharing and go for your panel questions. So thank you to all our speakers for your insightful presentation and for sharing your knowledge with this large audience that is attending today's seminar in the panel. Um, a reminder that the way for the audience to interact with the panelists is through the Q&A icon in Zoom. Um, we have already received a large number of questions and let me pose the first one to any of the panelists. Um, most of you refer to lithium ion batteries, which are certainly the most commonly used in electrical vehicles and portable electronics. Um, with different chemistry from the electrodes. We expect that lithium ion batteries will continue to be used for many years in the future with, as you indicated, many improvements yet to come. The first question is regarding solid state batteries. Could you share with us the stage of development when we could expect to have them in mass production for consumer products and as pertinent to this colloquium, um, what are the thermal challenges we expect that solid state batteries will have? Yeah, Professor Wang mentioned a little bit of the density issues. Maybe you can address some of these uh, issues. Sure, uh, I'm going to make it quick. Uh, I think the commercial uh, mass production solid state battery probably will be after 2030. And, and there's a lot of challenges that need to be overcome uh, scientifically and engineering wise. Now, uh, one thing that we do know in terms of its impact on thermal management is basically the fact that almost all solid state battery would have to operate at an elevated temperature, something about you know, 60 degrees Celsius. So I think we have to recalibrate you know, how we do thermal management. Excellent. Um, the next question from Nicholas Jankowski uh, goes to Dr. Ahmad Pesaran and says the following, for current SOA, vehicle battery packs, is heat generation volumetrically uniform? On what scale are the cell thermal time constants relative to realistic vehicle heating transients? And are we near the point where we can't just apply external cooling schemes and need to look at integrating thermal design 
into the cell itself? Thank you for that question. I think uh, the, uh, the heat generation can be non form uh, in the cell at high rates. Uh, as you saw that uh, kind of depending on the geometry, uh, if the terminals are different size, the current distribution could be different. So heat generation depends on the current distribution inside the cell. Uh, so uh, as a result, you have, one of the things that transient when you, because of the thermal mass of the battery, uh, that he has, you have a large battery pack. Uh, transients kind of when you accelerate quickly in a car, that's what I'm understanding from your question is, then the high current goes through it, but it goes through a big pack. So the, uh, the spike in temperature is not as significant uh, as the, uh, the spike in the power from the battery, from the vehicle. So, but it takes a while to come. So thanks God that you don't accelerate for two hours. <laughs> uh, uh, but for fast charging, that can happen because yeah, you're fast charging at C rate or 60 rate, something at, for 10 minutes. So that's a different thermal management required for those kind of things. Um, some people talk about the thermal management for on operation of the vehicle and some during the uh, fast charging. Uh, so, uh, so the other question was that can the heat, uh, heat projection would be in a cell itself? Maybe for uh, solid state batteries that we need to do that. But I think for lithium ion batteries, it's gonna be very challenging to do that. And I agree with uh, Chow Yang that kind of, uh, he was not uh, too, I mean, kind of 2000, late 2020s uh, is the one that solid state battery may come to market. We're gonna have lots of uh, advanced lithium ion batteries uh, for a long time to come. Thank you. We have time for only one additional question from the audience. Um, let me choose the question from Yang Yang Zhu. It says the following. It seems that thermal management is mainly from outside the battery. Could internal thermal management without compromising energy density too much be worth pursuing in combination with cooling the exterior? I think this is a great question. <laughs> uh, I think uh, people have not been able to explore the uh, internal cooling yet. So this is from Yang Ying. I think I know Yang Ying at uh, UCSB. Uh, these require a very innovative solution. Certainly on top of my head, I couldn't think of anything yet. But if something that could be done, uh, enhance internal cooling, reduce the center of the battery, the temperature gradient from the outside, right? So, so far you have this multi-layer of electro separator, electro separator, multi-layer stack up. Separator is not a good heat conductor right there. So somehow you can enhance that. I think that could be fantastic. Yeah, maybe something could be done in a very in innovative way. At my response that is possible, probably something for Eric's application that has cost is not that important. The mission is so important, so you can <laughs> spend a lot of money. But for vehicle applications, the cost is very sensitive. So anything you do with inside the battery has to consider some cost. Thank you. Uh, Let me pose a final question from the long list that we received that goes to Eric um, Darcy and comes from Cody, Yakobuchi, and it says the following, how far are we from electrified urban air mobility and hybrid me medium to long range flight? Uh, it is hard to overcome the fact that a good portion of batteries is dead mass in flight once used and that energy densities are still low compared to fuels but it is essential that we solve it to reduce aviation emissions. Well, it's a good question. Um, it's looking at my crystal ball, um, I would say for short term duration flights, like one hour flights, um, eVTOL aircraft, the uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing flying vehicles, I think is the question. Um, I think that could be within five years is possible. Um, it's going to require a, a lot of innovation, um, but uh, 
I think that's doable. As far as going to longer range for uh, hybrid systems would have to work. I mean, this is where fuel cells and other type of propulsion systems, chemical propulsion, um, a hybrid would work such that the batteries would only be there for the takeoff and the landing where noise is uh, much more of an issue. Thank you. Um, we're very grateful to our distinguished speakers for your excellent educational presentations and for the enlightening informative responses, many of which will come um, and we will be answering them online. Um, let's see. And also thank you to the audience for your participation and your insightful questions. Um, we received many more than what we could possibly cover. Um, and as we said earlier, we will post the questions online along with a recording of this uh, colloquium on YouTube. So I want to say a few words about the next colloquium, which will cover the topic of extracting water from air with an exceptional panel of international experts. Uh, it will be on July 8th, which is three weeks from today, instead of the typical two weeks in between colloquia, because two weeks from today is July 1st and it's a holiday in the US. And two weeks after, on July 22nd, the topic will be high thermal conductivity materials, same time, same Zoom link, and all of you are invited to participate. Um, a few final words. Um, I want also to mention that building on today's topic on batteries, we're planning a follow-up colloquium in August on thermal management of electrical vehicles at the system level to discuss uh, some of the emerging trends and the new engineering challenges. Now, the organizers are very interested in your feedback for future events, your feedback on speakers, on topics, on format, and also what would make this colloquia an even better experience. You can also sign up uh, to receive uh, notices of future events by email. Um, and a reminder that you can find videos and Q&A sections from past colloquia on the website and on YouTube. Um, after this event concludes, just in a few minutes, we will keep Zoom open for about five more minutes. Um, so you can type in your comments and suggestions. A final word um, from my side, it has been a privilege to moderate this panel with distinguished speakers, great information and education about the state of the art in these important topics and with participants coming from every corner of the world. We have over 500 participants today. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Um,